needs to be addressed a little bit. Um, uh, Mr. Warden is in the room. This is a cavity where our, our recruits go. Um, currently, I think we average about five per class. And the fundamentals of traffic stops are taught through the uh, law enforcement training academy. We have witnessed his training program. If we have any concerns, we would bring it to the board's attention, but we haven't had any. Um, the fundamentals are, are just that. Um, it's a practice mode. It's not actually on the street. It's not actually engagement in traffic going by. It's just on the static parking lot. Um, and they only get uh, two practical sessions, but they do get many reps. Um, along with traffic stops, they're obviously taught the, the Fourth Amendment. Uh, a traffic stop is ultimately a seizure. It is a Fourth Amendment uh, consideration, so the traffic stop must be uh, reasonable. Uh, unless that probable cause or reasonable suspicion. Um, once the academy is concluded, um, the officers go through the field training program here. During the field training, the officers obviously learn the fundamentals of traffic stops actually on the street. Um, they also taught to uh, that the, the traffic stop must be within state statute, within federal law, for obvious reasons. Um, probable cause or reasonable suspicion must occur for that vehicle to have been stopped and that the conduct with the contact with the, the driver must be of a reasonable time now somebody asked what a reasonable time is well that's dependent on the circumstances um, we do not train our teach our officers to uh, stop a vehicle beyond any being involved in a law violation or reasonable suspicion and we do teach about uh, biased policing so now <clears throat> when it comes to the disparity index we'll talk a little bit about that uh, we are, let's talk, let me start by saying, let's talk about what, uh, searches and seizures of the vehicle. Um, the chief of police, uh, after this video involving the street crimes officer came out, we are reapproaching how we train our officers on um, marijuana residue within a vehicle. Obviously, the Missouri marijuana law has changed uh, how we approach the odor of marijuana and much less the what we could call shake inside the vehicle. Um, we're going to be taking additional steps that we're currently writing the policies and then ultimately will be a training issue for me to do to all officers that if they suspect an odor of marijuana or they see residue in the vehicle, but they will have to start recording that. They will also have to um, um, collect some of the marijuana and do a field test on it in front of the camera to show that their suspicion was actually correct, even if they have no intentions of charging the person with a crime. Um, we normally don't charge people for does everybody understand what I mean by shake? Shake is just like the, the residue of making up a marijuana cigarette that may fall out of while doing so, or marijuana seeds, stuff like that. Um, so, the so to, to also take away from the um, if you suspect a person has um, marijuana in the vehicle by the odor of marijuana. Uh, they should not be asking for consent to search. They should just explain to the person, I, I noticed an odor of marijuana in the vehicle, and I noticed marijuana residue by the shifter console on the floorboard. The element of surprise is gone. I mean, you might as well be straight and honest with the person and tell them this is what it is, and of all that is in the vehicle is shaker marijuana, we're not going to charge you with a crime. Um, we have an ordinance in place that that is the lowest denominator. Um, the approach to a traffic stop, um, you know, we already have dropped the signature requirement on summonses. Um, we do not require people to sign summonses in order to appear in court. Um, there is a bottom of the citation that says that, you know, you buy hereby signing here is not a plea of guilt, it just says that you promise to appear in the court date. Well, if I have uh, Mr. Warden, for example, I'm positively identified as a driver's license or I have run him and see his picture. I do not need his signature on that summons to, to have him show up for court. So we, know, we are no longer requiring signatures. Uh, we can just hand the person the summons and explain the court date and time if necessary. The chief of police's policy is still in place that says that uh, you will only stop vehicles for moving uh, hazardous moving violations, so we're not even stopping for uh, lower infraction offenses at this point um, so um, how you train an officer I think it starts with recruitment um, we are looking for people with communication skills we're looking for people with the ability maturity uh, to understand when they're engaging someone to not 
get hostile. I think honest and openness is the best policy when you're engaging a person. Good afternoon. My name is Officer Gordon with the Columbia Police Department. The reason I stopped you is because you did this or because of this. Then I ask you for their driver's license and proof of insurance. They cannot produce the driver's license, and most people can't really produce their insurance at this point because everything's gone in the digital age, right? Yeah. As long as they can produce the proof of insurance in a digital format, and that's fine. If I'm going to suspect a person I'm not going to write a ticket, I usually just stand by the car and I run the driver's license right there. I say, if you just give me a minute, I'll run the driver's license, and then I, and if they're valid, I give them the driver's license back and say, hey, you, you committed this crime. I ask next time if you drive in a safe, <coughs> in a safe manner. Also, for equipment violations, if we were stopping, I will tell you how I approach it and how I taught it as an FTO. The law says you have to not only operate a vehicle with faulty brake lights, for example, or take your taillights. You always ask the person, did you know that your taillights weren't working? How many people knew their taillights weren't working? How many people can see the rear of their car while they're driving? Exactly. Well, you just advise them, hey, this is just a courtesy stop, the traffic stop, the, 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 your taillights are not working. Please turn on your hazardous lights and to make sure you go get the fuse repair to drive off. So you ask how I'm teaching traffic stops or how I'm teaching my FTOs is it's all about the personal contact. This does not have to be um, um, confrontation. The way we teach our officers to do traffic stops is to be professional, maintain their professionalism, and be honest with the person that they're engaging. It has the element of surprise, we can keep talking about the element of surprise because you don't want the person driving off, but what if the person does drive off? And you have to have them positively identified. Usually by a driver's license, you do. You follow up with a warrant arrest. This goes back to our pursuit policy that we're, we have right now, and our officers are using the pursuit policy correctly, and that they're not pursuing when they have the people identified, just had one two days ago. So, uh, in the nutshell, that is how we're doing traffic stop training, um, and how I'm teaching my FTOs to do traffic stops at least. Um, how the officers deploy that on the street after field training is where we follow up with the assistant chiefs of patrol and the traffic unit. Um, by the way, the officers also do spend in field training some time with our DWI unit to learn how to do uh, DWI arrests because those are a little bit more complicated uh, given the processes they have to go to. There's certain steps you have to take within the Missouri statute and within um, um, the Department of Revenue for the driver's license uh, actions. That's in a nutshell. I know that you may want a little bit more, and I'm here to answer any questions that you have about that. On the signing of the tickets, yes, sir. that's a, probably, I understand the policy, but do the officers uh, still give them the chance to sign? And if they don't sign, you're not arguing with them? Or, or you just literally just never have anybody signing? <clears throat> Right now, it's, some of the officers are, we're not writing a lot of tickets right now, um, mainly because the officers are just busy. Uh, I will be honest with you, sir, in my time, I, for, I worked for the first nine and a half years of my career at the Sheriff's Department, and, and we never really did ask for signatures, except for our criminal offenses, like a even guy. And a lot of that goes back to why are you handing, if someone's already in confrontation, why are you handing them a, a ticket book to throw at you or to throw on the ground and engage? Um, there are some officers that are asking for signatures. I will tell you that once we get into the digital format, which we are, our RMS system is currently moving to, uh, that won't even be an option because the citation auto files and auto goes to court. So the person gets a copy of the citation and it has all the information on it. There's no signature block. And we also have on the video, uh, obviously the body camera video should be retained. And you'll know if the person is saying that, hey, I refuse to, I'm, I'm not going to appear in court. Depending on the offense, obviously what we don't want to get into is, um, again, that confrontation of, I'm not signing anything. Yeah, well, I understand yeah. that. Yeah, I know you do. I know you do. But for the people other members of the, the board, I want you to understand, we don't, want, we don't want that. If somebody adamantly refuses to sign a ticket, that doesn't mean they're not going to show up in court. So, uh, so it would be fair to say that, the policy is not uniformly being applied, but soon it will be uniformly applied because it just simply won't be an option. Yeah, we just won't. The, uh oh, and I also forgot to tell you, uh, the chief of police, and rightfully so, requests or requires that any officer that stops a vehicle, the person, if it's possible, and there's times where it's not possible, there's a few extremes, 
but he does require everyone to be given a copy of a written warning that they're not issued a summons to show the legitimacy of the traffic stop and who stops you and for what reason. Um, so you should get something, one or the other, a citation or a written warning. Uh, again, there are circumstances where that, if, you know, if they're standing on the side of the highway and it's dangerous, they're not going to do that. Um, and really, the, the no signature policy mm -hmm. include the, what I consider the more serious things like driving while suspended, no. driving while intoxicated, and leaving no. the scene. No. Those you still will try yeah, to. Yeah, those are those are those are rising to levels of misdemeanor crimes. No, sir. Okay. No, that's completely separate. If we don't bond them, you know, we're not bonding on DWI right now. It's a release on signature that they have to sign. And then they sign all of them. They sign the original offense and the uh, DWI signs. Really, it's about not putting people into the jail right now because of COVID. Even if they are going to post bond, we don't want that temporary, even temporary exposure inside of the jail environment. So people for DWI are just on signature now, and let if, it's, if they're able to be. Yes, Mr. Okay. Yes, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. Okay. Uh, so please. I, they, I, I hope so. Okay. They go through two sessions of training at the academy. Well, they do actually more than that. Um, they have. I'll let Mr. Ward speak about yeah, we, uh, it. It's it's two practical sessions. Okay. But there's also classroom. And so, and I'm not exactly, I don't know the exact number, but for, for, for example, we'll do eight hours of practical sessions, but during the, that, that eight hours, there are actually five different traffic stop stations that they rotate through. Okay. So during that eight hours, they may do 20 or 25 or 30 traffic stop practices. Okay. Um, and then in addition to that, we also have the had the classroom portion of that where we're, where we're talking about um, the steps as you go through and proper approach and tactical retreat and, and all of those other things that might go into that. So, okay. so and, yeah, it's yeah. two practicals kind of sounds like, man, that's not much, but, <laughs> but, but it, it's, it's more than what it sounds like it is. Yes. Yeah, so. Well, and also on top of it, there's a lot of things that go into the traffic stop component. So let me, let me give you some example of, of academy topics that apply to traffic stops. So yes, Mr. Ward is correct. It's two practical sessions. They also get statutory law, which teaches them. Uh, they get constitutional law, which is about the you know search and seizure Fourth Amendment. They get statutory law, which is what is a violation of law, including traffic offenses. Um, then they get a complete. I don't know how long you guys spend on con con the constitutional law. I know it's at least four hours on search and seizure. Uh, then they get uh, the classroom portion of the practical the steps, including felony traffic stops, which is the high risk traffic stops, um, and then de-escalation. Because most of our confrontations occur, well, we're not doing as many traffic stops, but prior to that, you get a lot of complaints about traffic stops because the person feels they were improperly just or stopped. And that's where the argument suits. And that's where we always try to get people to de-escalate and say, hey, if you got a complaint, don't argue on the street about it, right? Take it up the supervisor at CPD or take it up to the court, right? Um, on the streets, not where we argue about a traffic stop. If the officer's done something wrong, in our case, it should be recorded two, two different directions one with the body camera and two with the car camera. So it should capture everything. Uh, our car cameras, just so you're aware, we upgraded our car camera systems over the last five years. Our car cameras now have three cameras in them one in the back seat full time and then two to the front. One's a more narrow focus view and one's a wide view because a lot of things happen, you know, on a sidewalk or people approach the traffic stop and you, you see the officer talking to somebody but you don't know who he's talking to or her he's talking to. So now you have this pan view. Um, so um, I, when I was a patrol supervisor, I always encouraged people, hey, don't never argue with a uh, traffic stop with an officer. If you have a complaint about the officer's conduct, that's what the complaint system's for. You have a, if you think you know it's a court issue, that's what the judge is for. Um, we will always investigate our officer's conduct, and with the body cameras and the car cameras, there's just no, there's no, it either happened or didn't happen. Um, so, could you give us some idea? Of, and I'll tell you why I want to 
do this. Um, it, I guess it's my kind of understanding, just from being around a while, that the, the average length of time police officers are on the street has been decreasing over time. In my day, there used to be 20-year-old, 20 20-year 20 veteran, 20 veterans were pretty normal. Yes, sir. Is that still normal, or would you agree that they're getting no. much? No, I, and, and I'm going to use Mr. Warden as an example again, because Mr. Warden's about the time that the, the, with the 20-year retirement, that's about the time with that step of people, and he can talk to you more about the history, but we had this 20 and out retirement, and I'm kind of on the latter end of it before the 20-year retirement was removed. And we have large chunks of officers that all came in, in the same time. But again, Mr. Warden can I tell you, at his group of people, uh, how many people, I, I, I imagine there's, well, there's nobody left from John's original group of people at CPD anymore. Um, and I'm on the latter end of my group. So the average age of in years of experience on patrol right now is, is under, is largely is under four or five years. And I would say it's even, on the night shifts, it's even under two years is the higher number. Because when you look at what we're doing, Mr. Ward puts on three academies a year. We're averaging four or five people in each one of his academies. So that's 15 officers a year that his academy is producing for the Columbia Police Department. And that's replacing people. And we right now have uh, 14 vacancies. So. And, so. And, I think, and I think there's a couple of things that go into that. I, I agree that, that the... The, the rotation at CPD happened the 20 year and out was was a big took a big hit but I also think that you're you're looking at a different a different generation I mean you know, they, they, they aren't they aren't those 20 years at the same place people they want to go do different things and and you know different experiences and all of that so I think you have some of that as well um, just as I, you know for for example when I applied in 1990, there were 300 people that took the test for two openings. And five people interviewed last week, two made the eligibility list. So, you know, so, so just the difference in sheer numbers of the first individuals wanting to do, wanting to be police officers has dropped, but, but all of these other kind of periphery things that have happened are also contributing to that. So I can remember I was, I was the sergeant over the per, personnel development unit, which is recruiting, hiring, and training before I left, and we had to drop our, our minimum experience of our field training officers from five years to three because we didn't have enough officers with five years experience. Well, that's kind of so, what I'm trying to drive at ultimately, is the police department of today is younger and has a different perception of policing than... <clears throat> even five years ago. Well, and, and, and the people that are even leaving our department are going to other departments. They're getting out law enforcement. Whether they're going to work at Veterans United or they're going to work somewhere else, they're not staying in law enforcement. Very few, in the last um, six months, I only know of one officer, make sure, I personally only know one officer that's left the department and he went to South Carolina to be a police officer because that's where him and his wife really wanted to move to, and he'd only been here uh, four or five years. So, and this this generation is more of what I consider more mobile. They do, they do seem to move more. Um, but what we have tried to do is, and now this is not, just kind of give you a little bit of a comparison. I was on the phone yesterday with uh, a captain from the Minneapolis, Minnesota Police Department. Now, granted, that's where George Floyd happened, but you know, they have, they have a swarm of 1,800 officers. They're down to 918, um, and they can't they can't find any evidence. Um, so now what we're getting ready to is we're getting ready to get over to what I kind of refer to as a bidding war, because you've got police departments all over the nation that are offering one one department close to us is offering five thousand dollars sign on bonus to get hired, five hundred dollars after the first, I'm sorry, five thousand sign on bonus, five thousand when you when you complete field training, you've been there one or, or sorry yeah, one year. And then five thousand dollars after a completion of, of, of two years of law or two years of two years of time. It's fifteen thousand dollars. These officers are remarkable. They know that. They they go, hey, they don't mind moving. I'm born and raised in Columbia, Missouri. I, I don't want to leave. My family's here, my dad's here, my mom's here. I mean, there's a reason why we had cops that, you know, they anchored themselves here. The kids were going to Columbia Public Schools. You know, again, I just go back to Mr. Warden because Mr. Warden and I go way back. His kids went to school here. He went to him here. 
you know, it, he has a history here. These kids, they're just in coffee. These young officers, they don't really have that there. So um, we have to find a way of incentivizing to get those officers. I like to recruit the more mature people. Um, the officers that they've either, I, I do like the post-military because they have a little bit of that, they're not that 21, 22 year old, they've got a little bit of that shaved off. Uh, but like we just recently hired a person who's in his 30s from Water and Light. But he's got the people skills. That's what it takes. Um, the ability to talk to somebody, the ability to have a good temperament, and the ability to just calm, be a calm, a, a calm person in a chaotic situation are skills that are very hard to teach. Right? And then you have your leadership skills, which those people eventually carve themselves out over time. Um, so that's what I look for when I interview people. Um, I will also tell you, I ask people, you know, why do you want to be a cop? They have to want to do this job. I mean, when I say want, they have to want to do this job. Because you have to be able to take the stuff that goes with it and, and be able to go. They weren't mad at me. They're, at, they're mad at this uniform. They're mad at this. They're not mad at me as a person. And you, as soon as you can deflect that off, it helps keep you calm and go, hey, I understand why you're mad. And put yourself in their shoes for a little bit. This is the kind of stuff we teach our FTOs. And this was the stuff that I came up with. I learned from him when I was one of his FTOs, and he and I'm just passing on to the next generation. We really need to try to find that that the the you know, one former officer once said the worst thing that ever happened to law enforcement was the air conditioning. Because the car windows went up. <laughs> I always taught my recruits, windows down, air conditioner full up. Wintertime, windows down, heater full up. Because you're more accessible when the windows are rolled down. Um, people like to see that. This. Uh, that's what they want to see. And the cop waving back. So it goes back to what Chief Jones has been talking about forever when we talk about community policing. This goes back to the original force squad that worked down in, um, you know, the Kathy Dodds of the world and the people like that that were out there foot patrolling and got to know the neighborhoods. That's how you control this. That's how you have um, the communist tendency to trust you more when the numbers are a little bit out of whack. So it goes back to, does it all go back to trust? We got on a tangent, sorry. Yes, sir. Sorry. Um, part of the reason the board was formed was like to address like the racial disparities in policing. Um, some of the recommendations that have come from numerous studies, not just in Columbia, uh, always revert back to training. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of curious to know, as um, from a training perspective, um, what have you or what what can you do to correct or reverse that trend? And if it comes from like the operations side of the fence, too, I'd be kind of curious to hear where we're being lost in translation. Well. <clears throat> First, we have to, we have to, and we have not been able to do a good job with it because we have a, we, we had a, a very poor RMS system. Um, traffic stops are a, a tool that the officers use to make the roadways safer, right? We go through, through spikes of fatal accidents. All of a sudden, a lot of these guys, now we, luckily we have one of the, True, truly, not me saying this, Department of Highway Safety, one of the best DWI users, I think he's wide-striven DWIs down, but I also think because Uber, if you go back in the day, they want to cabin this down. Um, from the training recruit, training perspective of it, is, it starts with, obviously, um, why are we doing traffic stops for? I think that's the first, needs to be the first thing. Are we doing traffic stops to actually curve um, accidents? Um, to stop loss of property and, and injuries to people? Are we doing traffic stops as a as a proactive law enforcement tool to for criminal interdiction? Those are the two ways you gotta break it down. Um, when I had the traffic unit and when I had South Patrol, I was told my officers I'd have the crime analysis person run my stats and say this is the highest areas in which um, accidents are occurring, that's where I would like my traffic enforcement to focus on because it was data driven. It's also data driven when you start having a lot of car break-ins at two or three o'clock in the morning. Um, 
you know, we had, like it was last summer, we had literally five cars stolen one night. Um, that's where another tool of traffic stops come into place because the criminal element has to move in some form or fashion. Um, so you have the criminal addiction, then you have actually the reduction of uh, loss of loss or injury of life and protection of property, which is means stopping crashes and raising everybody's insurance rates. How you break down those tool, those two, in my view, this is John Gordon's view as the, as the training coordinator, is I teach the officers to use data-driven information and say, why are you stopping this call? Like I always ask, why are you asking for consent to search? I always ask that. When I was a patrol supervisor, I said, why would you ask for consent to search? What drove you to ask for consent to search? You either have reasonable suspicion or follow a cause. That's my view. So I really wasn't a big fan of consent to search to begin with. I'm not against it because I think there's sometimes you just can't put your finger on it as a patrol officer. Something's not standing up, body language, human behavior. You feel something's wrong. But we've got to get better at bringing everybody together and having officers and being on one training platform. And then reinforcing that with part policy. You want to know what's really hurt us lately? And I know everybody's probably tired of hearing this word, but COVID. I had to cut my last sessions of in-service and go to virtual. I'd go online. Does anybody here believe that online training is, is, a, is a really a very good training tool? Or is having an instructor in there engaging somebody and bringing up real stats and saying, hey, officers from this beat, your stats are selling this. Why is that? Uh, Chief is looking at bringing a form of ComStat back. Comstat is some place where we would look at these types of numbers. Uh, Chief Burton did a form of Comstat, and it's to you know we are looking at the traffic stop numbers monthly, and saying why are these numbers the way they are? What has driven the numbers to be that part? So you ask me what's the breakdown in the two? Well, number one is we could actually be in a room together without without having to have this major pause. <laughs> uh, let me ask you, sir, and I know you don't know much about our train break. How many months do you think it takes for me to, to, to get to every officer at the Columbia Police Department? No, I wouldn't even hazard to guess. Four months for me to have one, well, three months for me to have one training session of the same topic. It's two training sessions a month for three months. That's to reach all the Columbia Police officers. And I only get three sessions a year. So nine training sessions, or sorry, there's more than that. There's, but it's three different types of training sessions, three, uh, three, three a year. That's all I get. So when you ask what's the breakdown, well, if I teach the first group in, in January and the last group in March, a lot of things may have changed in that time. But then operations for the next nine months has to carry that message and keep it, keep it going. It's problematic. For the last year, our training has been good training when we were allowed to do it in person, but it's been hard because COVID has totally destroyed the training environment, in my view. Uh, four hours, we, had, we, we are by state statute, no, state statute <coughs> by post requirements, two hours of firearms training. Two hours is all we're supposed to have for officers to shoot their firearms in training. Um, 24 total hours, it, it, well, we need more time. We need more training. <laughs> he, 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 he's not his head because he knows the same thing when he was he was over at TRU. The man, the man knows that the key to any successful law enforcement department is training. You have to constantly be training your people, and you have to give the time to do it. And right now, we don't have time. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I left work at um, when I left the road, I worked the road today. I had to go to uh, do some other things, but I went to work the road today. When I got done um, and logged off the car, there was 12 calls pending, and that's light. There's usually 16 to 18 calls pending. Um, they had 10 officers today to cover the whole city of Columbia. How am I supposed to take people off the road and train them? So you're asking me to disconnect? It's, it takes four months that's why people don't really understand how training works. You folks have a great idea and want us to implement it. It takes me, I'm now creating the calendar for February of 2022. 
to start. Any topic this brings for us now won't even be looked at till February 22 by the officers. And that's if we're doing in person. Highly likely, does anybody think this is gonna be gone away by February 2022, this COVID? Probably not, which means we're going to have to do virtual again. And it just does not deliver the message right now, in my view. Um, I'm not trying to make excuses, folks. I'm just trying to lay down that I think virtual, <laughs> virtual training is just not effective. Right, and I, I can certainly see that being a challenge moving forward. But I mean, just looking at the historical data, right. um, COVID doesn't really play into that those figures. I think it plays in the last two years. Right. Because by the time by the time a problem is recognized, mm -hmm. by the time a problem is recognized and identified and said, okay, well, this is a training. By the time you can get that training, I, I can throw together a, a post-certified lesson plan in two hours for what you're asking for. But then to roll that out to all the officers in the Columbia Police Department and reinforce that by policy, and then to put some checking mechanisms in place, I think that's where your, your problem is. Um, the, we also have seen um, the, the digger, the bigger, the, the, you know, the, the in-depth analysis that comes out of this is, you know, we're not able to, like I added the two questions to the profile, like, did the person admit to the use of controlled substances in the car? That's for the odor of marijuana, because most of the time they'll admit to you. Yeah, Jim was in the car an hour ago and smoked, smoked a joint. Okay, well that explains that. And then I had the other question, I can't remember what that question was off the top of my head. Um, but in order to implement a training program, it's not an immediate term. It is a, honestly, a six to nine month impact before it happens. And then I don't know how you set your benchmarks to how what you're going to look at, right? There's no, it's kind of like changing the curriculum at Columbia Public Schools or the university. There's no, there's no fast process. It's a big ship that has to, has to steer, but it needs a wide turn. Um, only thing I can do in, in the way I feel like you address this disparity is through the academy, starting with teaching you know, in our case, the respect and, and treating everybody the way you want them treated, and I think they do a good job of doing that at the academy, and then reinforcing that through our field training. That's the biggest impact. You want to have the biggest impact on any new officer. You know, you're a football coach. Would you rather start a football player when they're five years old and work them all the way up to high school, or get them when they have all the training scars from other bad coaches and you get them in high school? Right? right. How hard is it to take a training scar out? Uh, it's impossible. Is that... They know everything already. Now, I will, I will tell you that Mr. Warden's academy has been very <clears> open <throat> to suggestions that we have made, and that's how you do it, is you go, you have a good academy, one with morals and ethics, and let them mold them into, he gives the foundation, and then I take my FTOs and we mold them into the cop we want, and what we need to be integrating more is our community policing aspect, because that's all about caring and taking ownership in a beat. That's how you start to address the disparity index in my view. But it has to start at the very beginning. And this department is fortunate enough they can do that because it is so young. Um, we're, you won't have the training scars that you have now. Uh, but it's it's hard to change a direction of a big shift. And I'll be honest with you, folks, we work our butts off. Um, I'm not talking as just an administrator. I'm, I'm taking calls on the road because our patrol unit's hurting that act. But I also think that if you wear this uniform, you ought to get on the road every once in a while to remember why you do the job. I love the road. Uh, but I also have responsibilities, and one of which is this unit, and trying to find people to recruit, which is, God, it's just impossible at this point. So, sir, I, I, you have a very valid point. I'm sorry I didn't give you the direct answer, because I don't know if there is a direct answer how you can do it in training. To this, I think it all starts with the officer and molding them to the cop that you want. And again, Columbia's fortunate enough they're having a bunch of young officers right now, and you can make that the officers you want. And I think Chief Jones is impressing that onto his officers. This is my expectation character, professionalism, dedication. We don't just say it, we mean it. And if an officer does something wrong, I always ask him, and we're in this call where you're acting with character, professionalism, and dedication. At what point did you go off the rails? And how can we correct it? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Sir, did I answer your question or did I not? 
Uh, well, I mean, I mean it, it, but, but by not having like a direct solution, I, I mean, it just goes back to the same suspicions. That it's organizational culture that's leading a lot of the subjective engagement that the police engages with the community. Um, so like when you talk about like a, um, like a, a 700% disparity between like, you know, pulling over a black driver, for example, mm -hmm. um, looking at the recommendations, I'm not so sure that, you know, if training's doing like, you know, a good shakedown of like, you know, don't do this, I'm not sure how much more investment in training is going to yield an improvement versus is it the organization? Is it the policy? Is it tied to organizational performance or the, or the annual performance of the individual officers? No, um, stop. There's, I can tell you that we, the only people that, that annual performances that I would say that we look at traffic stops would be the DWI and the traffic unit because that is their that is their job. I mean, so you have to kind of sit there and say for DWI and traffic officers, part of their their job performance value would be not how many they did, but were they doing enough to to say that that I have a reason. Like right now, Lori Simpson, she's one of our traffic officers, has probably very low traffic stop stats, but she's also worked three very serious accidents in the last month. And those take about a week. Mr. Ward can also explain that because he was one of our traffic officers in an accident each, each crash takes about a week to reconstruct. So you can look at that, but from an officer perspective, we do not, we, we do not in their job evaluation, sure we would expect to see some traffic stops, but we don't go, you have a quota. Mm -hmm. And, not, and not, not a quota for tra number of traffic stops, not a quota for number of tickets by any means. That's against the law. Um, but, you know, if you saw an officer up there with zero traffic stops, you kind of got to go, hold on, you've got three complaints in your beat for speeding. You probably ought to be working Derby Ridge as one that always had speeding complaints. You should probably, that's not related to their um, to their performance, though. It's just one component. Um, I think you have very valid points. Um, how you dig deep into that, I can have all the trainings in the world, but if it's not reinforced or if it's not supported, or no, it was always going to be supported. The training's always supported, but how is it? How is the benchmarks looked at later? I think that's where we, right now, we don't have a crime analysis person. Mr. East um, went back to uh, uh, Public Works. Um, we're, we're hiring another one, because if you're not running that data, and we're not seeing it from, if I was a patrol commander, Jerry, or I'm sorry, uh, Richenberger or Slutty, they need to be seeing the numbers and going, hey, this officer has an extra high number of traffic stops where the, the list is, they, they stop them for equipment violations and they're asking for an absorbent number of searches. Those officers should be, and I think that's what Chief Jones is talking about, is doing those snapshot reviews. I know that the sergeants are supposed to be doing that now. Hmm. They're supposed to be going back and verifying. We're asking for consent to search, why? I think that's where it comes. I think you have to go, make the officer, why are you stopping cars for X? And your disparity index is here and you work in an area that's maybe not predominantly an area of color, and why is that being, why are you traffic stopping this absorbent number? Why is your numbers here where everyone else is this year? It's one thing to think if they're, they work in a subbeat and that's all they do, but we don't have a lot of officers doing that. Thanks. Yes, sir. I hope I answered better. Okay, so my question was, you mentioned that the officers uh, when, when the person is irate or irritated, yes, you tell them that um, yes, they can file a complaint. Yes, ma'am. Do they, do they have anything that they can give to the uh, whoever's upset? Do they walk them through the complaint process or they just say, call the police department and they file a complaint? I mean, how do they? There's several ways of approaching it. First of all, our policy says that we, we now, now, bear with me because Missouri state law just changed. Okay, so there's some changes here that we, we are able to change our policies. I'll tell you what I do, man. Okay. And I'll tell you what our officers have been told to do. Okay. If a person wishes to file a complaint, well, I mean, most of the time they ask for their, 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 their name and badge number anyway, which is another argument that starts because we don't have badge numbers. We have PIN numbers. Um, well, they're just hand them a business card. Takes that. They, they explain they can, they can make contact with an on-duty supervisor. They can request a supervisor to the same. Probably we try to do is avoid that because our supervisors are often running calls to or going to other calls, and we don't want them to go, well, I'll call for a supervisor, and the supervisor's like, well, well I'm caught up with this, the death investigation, for example. And then, even if someone dies of natural causes, 
our supervisor has to go to that call. It's a mandatory call. Well, I won't be there for 30 minutes. Well, now you got people that are just getting more work done. So we encourage them. Here, here's the card. I wrote in the back of it my sergeant's name. You'll call, contact my sergeant, or you can contact Internal Affairs. Internal Affairs, we have the website, explains our complaint policy, or, or, or pro, pro, sorry, complaint process, and how they can fill one out. Person come to the lobby of the Columbia Police Department anytime, and we have a compliment and a complaint form in baskets. And well, we're getting ready to put them up in the North Precinct. The lobby just is now starting to open up. We'll get them up in the North Building too. So, um, if someone doesn't want to fill one out or doesn't know how to fill one out, I have in the past offered to assist them, or I've taken a complaint over the phone and typed it out for them. Problem we have is state law now requires we have to have a signed complaint form. I don't agree. Um, I believe that you should, if a person wants to complain to an officer and they're, and they're involved, I think you should take the complaint. Um, so we're, we're working through this bill, officer bill of rights and how it's written. Um, so the policy is going to be changing, man. But I think it's part of le being legit with the community or having people look at your department and saying that you're asking them to look at it is you shouldn't put up roadblocks to file complaints. So um, I've always been someone who, you know, I feel like my officers that have nothing to hide, the body camera shows all. Um, I'm a firm believer, just John Gordon's view, of mediation. Because after you look at a video, you go, hey, I understand why you felt this way, but here's why the officer did this. But sometimes you can often find a common ground where people may look at things differently. Um, but man, we do try to walk somebody through the complaint process. Okay. The problem we have is also, uh, for, well, not problem, Columbia Police Department is has retained uh, was retaining a, a, a business to come in and rewrite our IA policy to be more reflective with that officer bill of rights, and that way we're we're within the law, but we're still doing our job properly. <clears throat> this kind of goes along with the, the citizen review board stuff. So, yes, sir. The uh, we have a data subcommittee. Yes, sir. Was meeting before this. So, uh, yes, sir. The last couple of meetings would have been. Uh, Working on, this, on the sorts of things you were talking about with the uh, having the data and uh, being able to use it to. Uh, <laughs> I, glasses fog. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's why I just left them in the truck. The, uh, uh, it doesn't take much for me to lose my train of thought. But the, uh, <clears throat> uh, I think the, the essence of what we're thinking is that if, if officers are. Uh, uh, asking the sort of question you were you were talking about, why why did I make this stop, or why am I asking for consent? That sets them up pretty well to uh, uh, to realize that uh, either they have a uh, a good reason that's clearly uh, uh, separate from race, or they uh, they shouldn't be doing what they thought they would do uh, because they, the facts just aren't. Uh, Convincing enough to uh, to do it, but if they take that minute to uh, to ask themselves, then uh, then they're much more likely to be able to avoid being distracted by stereotypes. And if the data <coughs> is adequate to uh, to capture the facts they are acting on, insofar as you can do that with checkoffs, that it's for instance, if it's if it's clear that an officer was following up on a detective's bulletin sure. or a uh, uh, call for service. Stop it, box. And, uh, and they were, they were, you know. That's the other box we added, I forgot. They're supposed to do the brief description about why they stopped a vehicle, if it was stopped for anything besides probable cause. Yeah. Well, the AG is requiring that, yeah. too, and it's just a matter of uh, uh, staff food and data collection. We don't yeah. have it for, yeah. Well, we, were already, we should have already been doing that. Well, if the, if the checkoffs are working right, and then the supervisor that goes back and looks at the data can say, well, here is a consent search, but, uh, or here, this officer did five consent searches over this time period, but I, I can see in looking at the data that uh, each, each one of those involved a, uh, uh, some sort of investigative stop. Mm -hmm. So it becomes much more likely that the officer uh, did have some facts in mind uh, when, when asking for consent. Yeah, if the, well, if the supervisor has some doubts about that, the supervisor can, can dig deeper and see if there really were convincing facts that justify asking for consent. 
But insofar as the, the data really does help identify what facts the officer was acting on, it becomes a lot easier for the uh, supervisor to give the officer feedback on uh, whether she's using odor searches correctly or, or that, That's correct. The, 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 what we, at least, at least what I, when you, when, and I haven't been on patrol for three years. I mean, I go work the road, but I haven't had, I'm not supervised patrol in three years. When I would go back, when I was patrol commander, I started off interviewing officers and asking about the consent searches. You often found that the officer actually had reasonable suspicion to search the vehicle. They just, they either because of inexperience could not have, or just couldn't find the word, couldn't articulate why they were doing what they were doing in a proper manner. Now, I'm not saying that justifies all of this disparity by any means. I'm just saying that that's a possibility. Um, I'm all about collecting data. I, I think that you know you and I have had many conversations going back five or six years now. Um, I've been putting enough years I should retire. Yeah. Well, and, but here's what it really comes down to is, but we're I think we're farther ahead than most cities because everybody started following what that you know you're doing it right when other cities are starting to follow what Columbia is doing. That's a good thing when we start to dig into data. And they're saying, well, why did you add those questions to your despair, or to your, well, because we, this would help us explain to our community why we were doing what we were doing. Right? Well, I agree with that. I see what a lot of other agencies are doing and talk to enough other chiefs that I, uh, uh, I don't know of anybody that's taking it as seriously as, uh, as Columbia is. No, sure. they're not. Because they, but that's okay. Um, I, think the, I think what you're saying is correct. Um, the sergeants and the the front line, the front line sergeant and the front line lieutenants of patrol op, called operations, they should be reviewing this data. Um, consent searches, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying there's not a place for them. It's just very, that's just kind of for me. It's a very gray line. Why would you ask for consent? As a patrol officer, I, I felt like I always had a reasonable suspicion or probable cause, and I just either did it or I didn't. Um, and but I was also, and again. You're talking about somebody who's been doing the job now for 26 years full time and 31 in the hour reserve time. I'm a little bit older and a little bit more, you know, I'm a little bit more of a straight shooter. You know, it's just, you just, you have probable cause or you don't. Um, kind of goes back to that. We don't, we don't joke around when we ask for consent to search and someone says no. No, they said no. Or, well, why do you want to search my car? Well, I'm just wondering if you have any weapons or contraband. I don't. Well, I don't know if I want you to search my car. That's a refusal. I don't know if you, I want you to search my car, I consider a refusal. We're done. And the judge will tell you, if you try to walk along that line, he's gonna throw your case out anyway. So don't even deal with it. Stop. Um, they either give you permission or they don't. I think the direction the data committee was going in there, right? And you'll have to be looked at by the whole committee. Yeah, yeah, Which I'm basically, if, there's a, if the data shows there's a disproportion someplace, like in odor searches or consent searches or whatever, then that flags the possibility of discrimination. Then it becomes the supervisor's responsibility to, or the supervisor needs the information necessary to, uh, to then look at what the officer is doing in each one of those consent searches and determine, or odor searches and determine whether they, you know, the I don't know how you're acting on facts or not. I don't know how you're going to get, people say odor of marijuana is subjective. I will argue that hydroponic marijuana, there's nothing subjective about it or not. There's either hydroponic <laughs> marijuana in a car or not. Because it reeks. There's no, you could, I mean, tell me, anybody in this room not have been around hydroponic marijuana? Okay, I, I can tell you right now, I'll, I can go get some out of our evidence locker, you'll, you'll put it in a bathroom for just 10 minutes, mm -hmm. you'll walk by the door, it, it reeks. There's nothing subjective about the odor of marijuana. It, it's either there or it's not. And you know it's coming. Oh, excuse me. You know it's coming from the car. You don't because as the wind goes by, you'll notice that the odor goes away, but then it pops back up. But nine times out of ten, if you ask the person, "Is there marijuana in the car?" as long as they don't have a large quantity, they'll admit to you, "And eh, I've got a few ounces down here, or I've got things, or somebody was smoking a marijuana in the car earlier." And when they're being honest with you, 
Okay, well, thank you for being honest. I appreciate that. We can do it all right. I don't know how we're ever going to get around that subjectiveness because. Well, I think that's fine. Part of the problem now is we see this huge disproportion for odor searches against black drivers. Right. But there's not enough information in the data to evaluate whether the officers are doing something wrong or not. If there's information about whether it was alcohol or marijuana or something else, and then there's. That I can agree with. Then there's information that, oh, it was verified or somebody else verified the odor or. Well, which is they're now trying to do with their camera process. Well, the camera can't detect the odor. Well, whatever. It is solvable, I think. But right now we can tell that there seem to be way too many odor searches against black drivers. And they're not. And the odor searches aren't resulting in someone being arrested for anything. So it sure seems like it's not. There's no public safety issue there. But if the data was better, we'd be able to. The public would know what officers were doing. And supervisors and command staff would be in a position to tell what help officers need to have in order to make sure they're not treating people differently because of race. I will agree with everything you said there except two points. Number one, I don't want to ever hear that marijuana is not a public safety hazard. It is. We had seven homicides in one year directly related to the distribution of marijuana. It's always going to be a hazard to the public. Number two, the motoring public under the influence of marijuana. If you read the studies from California and especially Colorado, marijuana use. I'm not here to say whether or not we should legalize marijuana or not. I'm just saying it is a health hazard. The study out of California, which is the HIDTA report, talked about the number of middle school and middle schoolers that were using marijuana now. And on top of it, the number of DUI accidents that went up. And it's very difficult to get a DUI case in the state of Missouri because you have to have, under our county prosecutor, you have to have a DRE, a drug recognition expert, exam to get a DUI arrest. So somebody could blow a zero on the breathalyzer, but they're in the influence of whether it's the marijuana or it's a prescription drug or anything else. We have to have a DRE exam, which we only have like three or four DRE examiners, and it takes an hour and a half. So someone operating a vehicle under the influence of especially a hydroponic marijuana is very much a health hazard. So if they're operating the vehicle and they've been using marijuana, I would say, and they have driving behaviors of an intoxicated driver or impaired driver, then they are a health hazard. And we are seeing an uptick, not just in that, an uptick in, God, we had an uptick in Ambien for a while. People were taking Ambien, just all things. But that's been a while. So just be careful when we say that marijuana is not a health hazard. Well, I was using whether there was an arrest made as an indication of something being serious enough to be a health hazard. I don't disagree with what you're saying otherwise. I think when it comes to marijuana arrest in general, the Columbia police officers recognize that the city of Columbia City Council has made it a low priority. But I still think that that is, you know, obviously it's reasonable suspicion to search a vehicle. And whether it's, you can't tell, I mean, yeah, hydroponic, you can tell. I mean, if they obviously have a large amount, by God, it blows you over. But the difference between whether or not personal use or distribution is a different thing. And the distribution is what caused seven of the thousands of homicides in a very short period of time. Well, we can tell from the data that it was a distribution issue. Sure, because they weren't being arrested. That shape. Then that would be, the transparency would allow us to say something more valuable about officer performance. I totally agree with everything you're saying there. And I believe that obviously those statistics should be looked at. I think the individual officers should be examined. Good question. Yes, sir. Take that mask off. I'm going to break. Professional engagement. Yes, sir. How close or how confident are you getting with some of the stuff you shared with us, you know, stating why you made the stop, copy of the warning ticket, when you're doing the marijuana test, doing it in front of your camera, 
and non-confrontational in a complaint system. How confident are you that these could be some bullets that can be a public service announcement for the press, for the general public to understand these are initial procedures that here are the expectations you should expect when you're interacting with police officers for traffic stops? Your PIO coordinator is right here. I will tell you that. Well, I knew that, but I had to put it on the record to ask that question. You can ask her anything because she's got answers too. I will tell you I'm always about transparency. The chief of police has also authorized me to start. It was a few months ago. We just had other things come up like everything I've heard come out, but we really need to start the citizen academy back up. I think we can put all this out. Now, whether the press covers it or not is a whole other story. And I think it has to be part of more of a more comprehensive, excuse me, I've got to take this off for just a minute. It has to be part of a more comprehensive, what are we doing to address all of these problems? And I think that's where your group comes together and how the chief wishes to present that either to the council and then to the public. I think obviously the council wants you to hear it also. That's up to the chief and Ms. Messina because she delivers, helps him focus that message. I think traffic stop data in this group here also, you know, your suggestions are taken very seriously by our group. I think that this kind of needs to be addressed by itself. And then you talk about community engagement. That's a whole separate thing, right? We don't want to get, we want them to focus on what we're doing to address racial disparity indexes in the police department. And engagement, although I think it's part of it, I think that's a whole separate thing because you don't want to get lost off the track that the, you know, the chief has said we will do written warnings. That is part of legitimizing the traffic stop. You know, we also, I think another thing we talked about there is we watched a video a few months ago where four officers were engaging a suspect who was under arrest. They had probable cause to arrest him. And they kept, they said, kept saying, put your hands behind your back. You're under arrest. What am I under arrest for? Now, I will ask you this. Does anybody in the room think that's not a legitimate question? I think it's very legitimate. Yeah. And the officer says you're under arrest. What am I under arrest for? Well, that's, you know, that's one of the things, that's one of my big focus is the interaction. How you proceed, introducing yourself, state why you're there, and pretty much a lot of things that you described earlier. But I also think it's important if you're going to change the mindset of the general public, they have to know these things, hear the expectations, hear the few, five simple things that you can expect out of my officers every time. Well, and I, I'll give you three, character, professionalism, and dedication. Right. I mean, I keep mentioning our motto because that is what it's there for. And what I, what I expect the officers to do, I agree with them. We could sit there and say there's the five points to the traffic stop, right? But everybody does their, everybody does a little bit differently, right? And I don't want to ever set, I don't want them to be robots. Because if I train somebody, you always approach the car and say, you know, good afternoon, my name is Officer. Well, what freaking good is it? You just stop them. You know, the engagement's already starting off the wrong foot. So you want them to be able to think through the processes, right? What I should expect an officer to do is, you should never take the traffic stop personal. Always maintain your professionalism even when they, and there, and I had a guy on the side of the interstate, I think he may have been my sergeant at the time. No, it was Will Green. Kept pushing my buttons. Kept pushing my, I mean, 84 miles an hour coming through Columbia. I mean, and I, and I stopped and I wrote him a ticket and it was everything but the ticket, right? He kept pushing my buttons, pushing my buttons, and I had to reboot myself each time. It's also hard when you don't have the time and experience as a police officer that I know that now, I didn't have to go deal with three other people that were mean to me, and now I'm doing this traffic stop, and now this person's mean, 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 and I've got troubles at home, and you know, my dad's having surgery, my wife's birthday's tonight, so I'm already in the doghouse, and here I am at this meeting, you know, that, those types of things, right? What we can do is teach them coping mechanisms and teach them professionalism. You know, the troopers build in, this is how we expect a traffic stop. This is how we expect a traffic stop. That works great until the traffic stop doesn't go how you train. 
then you got to think on your feet, like the, the external interference. Why are you stopping them? You know, if you haven't watched the, the, the ambush on the officers from Texas that happened a few days ago involving the, the uh, 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 fatal contact, those officers were set up for the ambush. If, if, if we seen, and now we're not, I'm not about ambushing a Columbia police officer, but we've seen the distractions where the that passenger gets out of the car and now you're distracted by the passenger so this person can either run or hit you. I mean, those things happen, so we don't want to pre-boot our I understand a pre-boot, but for every action, there's an opposite equal reaction. reaction. So the they mindset- not be, may not be equal. Well, correct. Because I can tell you, you, you play football, so it ain't always equal. No. <laughs> but, so, but the mindset, is, instead yes. of focusing on um, trying to get it right, do the right thing. Do the right thing comes from a lot of self-evaluation, self-practice, you know, and self-reflection. So my whole thing is, you know, there's a distrust. We know there's a distrust all the way across the board. Yes, sir. But if we can start with the personal interaction, hey, my name is Jerome Sally. I stopped you because. That's correct. You know, that's legitimizing the stop. Right. Telling a person why they're being stopped right off the bat, just like telling a person, if you've lost the element of surprise in placing somebody in handcuffs, then tell them they're under arrest. Just like the gentleman, that the, uh, the street crimes officer stopped for the shake, why do you, you know, step out of the car? Why do you, you need to step out of the car? Like, okay, I see shake marijuana residue by the console. Just step out of the car. If all you have in your car is shake, you'll be on your way. Right. It, 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 it goes back from, Quit being a charge situation to de. Our job should, as I like to say, we should be decharging the, the situation versus escalating it up, right? Correct. Right. It, it also goes back to how would you like your 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 wife and your parents treated? Correct. Right. Correct. That's I always ask the officers after. Nobody nobody feels good at even me as a patrol cop. Nobody feels good after a confrontation. Nobody walks away from that going. Well, I feel good about that, right? Just like you get in a fight with a coworker. No one feels good about it. Here. Even if you were right and they were wrong, or they were right and you were wrong. But what you do is you, you take these from learning experiences and go, uh, like I asked one, one officer a few weeks ago, how did you, how are you acting with character, professionalism, and dedication when you use the F word towards that person? That immediately, your professionalism has gone out the window as soon as you throw that out. Well, what you do is you incite a certain behavior pattern. And you're going to get that certain. Well, if I say that, well, yeah, exactly. Now, I was blessed, if you want to say that, that I, 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 when I started the sheriff's department, I worked a lot in the jail. Mm -hmm. No weapons, no pepper spray back then, and it was all about respect. Right. Now they may be residents of the jail, but you better about you better respect them. Because if you don't respect them, they don't care if they punch a police officer and get an extra while well, it's a deputy time. They didn't care if they punched you and got an extra 90 days. Or if they're going ready to go down to DOC for seven years, they didn't care. You better learn to respect people. And it taught me a hell of a lot of good communication skills. Because I was skinny back then and I couldn't fight anybody. <laughs> I, I hate to tell you this, that's what I've taught all my young administrators and some of my teachers. The worst possible thing that could happen to you if you push too far, you're gonna get punched. Mm -hmm. But you need to understand, help will be there. Mm -hmm. But the key is not to get punched. Right. Well, one of Mr. Ward's legendary instructors, who still works for him part time, is Bill Stevens. And Bill Stevens, if you have not spoken to this man, which I doubt he's come to this group. Bill has probably taught two thirds of the police officers in the state at one point in time. Maybe that's a little bit of exaggeration, but he is literally decades. And Bill Stevens always said, never act like something you're not. And number two, never say something you can't do. Right. So if you can't, if you say you're going to put your foot in somebody's butt, you better actually be able to put that 11 and a half in someone's tail, which isn't physically possible. Because someone's just ultimately going to call you out. And we, you all have had been around people that you know. Someone's going to call you one day on that, and you're going to get rocked. So you better start learning to talk instead of running your mouth. Because there's always somebody bigger on the block. Sure. Right? And even all the weapons that we have can be defeated if it's fast enough and they get close enough. And so is that part of your training? 
I mean, do, do they go through verbal judo? Yeah. Do, do they so, talk to people? Yeah, he, yes. Um, we, we are, well, and honestly, I'll tell you what, verbal judo, in my opinion, is one of the better programs. Um, you know, I, and I've been a classic example of using the, is there anything I can do or say to get your voluntary compliance? I always add on the, to my lawful and reasonable request. That's the clarity before forces apply. Uh, I mean, because typically you do still get the, you know, usually it's F off or something sarcastic, but you've done everything you can. But what I what I try to teach when I talk to officers about the application of forces, if the element of surprise is gone and you're in a controlled environment like, say, a room, slow down. The key to all use of force is to slow down. If it's in your control. So, for example, this was several years ago, we had a person in a back, in a, in a back bedroom we were arresting for domestic violence. He was also on PMP. Four officers were there. Three officers were there. I was the fourth. Because he was going to fight. He was, he was a, in the corner, up on a mattress. I ain't going back to prison. So every indication was, and the officers were all going to go, okay, we're going we're to get him. Let's go get him. Okay, well, I'm not one who likes to get kicked. So I said, slow down. What are we doing here? Have a plan. And they told him, first thing is always goes back to, you're under arrest. You're just under arrest. Understand that. It, it's happening. And the second thing is you go, what we did is we walked in. This officer is going to pepper spray you. That's going to burn. This officer is going to tase you. This officer is going to then hit you with a baton, and all this is going to hurt. And we walked and we talked and we talked. And about 20 minutes later, he came off the bed without him, without a single application of force. Because we allowed him to burn off that glucose, get over the anger, and understand that he was under arrest, and he's going to go to, he was going to go to jail. And we let him walk, get have a cigarette at the patrol car, Got him in the car and then we let him have another cigarette at the jail before we walked him in. Respect. No one got hurt. The offense report on force port went from this to this, right? Mr. Ward, I'll tell you that's communications 101 de escalation. If you control the scene and you can slow the processes down, slow the process down, show people <clears> respect. <throat> so we talk about, we can talk about, I grew up. A uh, place called 609 North Stadium. I went to Fairview, West Junior, and, and then went to Rockridge. Don't hate me. And then went to Rockridge. It's all about how you talk to people. That's what we have to teach. How do you talk to people and not take it personal? Just because they're being an ink to you does not mean you need to be an ink to them. That's how we've got to teach it. But ma'am and ladies of this panel, I tell you the same thing. I cannot build the gift for gravity to people. That came from their parents. <laughs> Temperament came from their parents. Sir, do you have a temper? Absolutely. Okay. How often is it flare? Little to none. Okay. And how'd you learn that? Patience. Who taught it to you? Uh, time. Yep. And who else taught it Mel Gray. I mean, excuse me, Mel Brown. No, there you go. But the point I'm just trying to make is it's built into the person. This is what we try to recruit for police officers. I will also tell you if we see an officer that's quick to the force application, we stop them. We pull them in fast. That's not what we want. Talking to your partner, it reduces app force application because then you then you work the subject as a group as a as a group versus one on one. Um, we also a few years ago, when we were kind of off traffic stops, but you know, certain calls now get a sergeant automatically. If it's a disturbance with a weapon, a sergeant is now part of the original dispatch. Not it used to be they dispatch two officers and then the sergeant. You know, now the sergeant is dispatched on the call. Now, if it, believe it or not, we sometimes get dispatched to a disturbance with a plastic spoon. Well, okay, the sergeant doesn't have to go to the call, but now the sergeant's still aware of the call. So if it's a disturbance with a suicidal subject who's locked in the bedroom with a gun, the sergeant's going. Because what we know happens is when a sergeant's on the scene, a plan is made. Things slow down. And this isn't brain surgery. This isn't police work 101. This was being done with Mr. Wardmore, the road, as a patrol sergeant. When the sergeant gets there, things have a tendency to slow down, and they have a tendency to start thinking things through. Versus two young officers with two years of experience going, this is what I was taught the academy, disturbance of the weapon, this is how I was supposed to handle it. Hold on, that disturbance for the weapons involving a 10 year old. Let's slow the processes down, let's think about this. 
Do we really need to go in there with a shield? No, it's a 10 year old. Billy, you in the bathroom? Yeah, okay. Are you all right? Yeah. Okay, when well, you're ready to come out, I just want to talk to you. You're not in trouble. That's how we expect our officers to approach. How you train them, it's hard. So how do you teach an officer that doesn't have any experience dealing with African American people? They grew up in Paris, Missouri, or something. They've never, okay, let me, let me, never interacted okay. with it. Now you have, because you know that there's hostility from my community. Mm -hmm. The minute they see uh, the red light in their rearview mirror or mm -hmm. whatever, so they're getting pumped up inside when they get pulled over. Man, this is gonna be some stuff. Bullshit. Right. Okay. So, so now you've got this this young officer, not aware of the history of of the uh, police in the African American community. This. The kid rolls down the window, and it's the kid. Because the older people have a different temperament, but it's the kid. Rolls down the window, and the officer doesn't say, do you know why I pulled you over this evening? <laughs> no, I don't want them to ever say that, because that was sum up to a smart-ass comment. So, why are you stopping me? Well, if you're stupid enough not know, why are you stopping me? I mean, that's what I would say, but go ahead. <laughs> so, so now you've got this kid that is instantly hostile, already hostile, already spiked himself up. What what do you how do you train that kid that has no history no foundation with dealing with African American people and uh, the attitude that they have in regards to law enforcement how do you how do you train him Okay, let me start by saying this how he treats an African American person I, bear with me I don't like that term just because you're American period right. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I don't know if politically correct person of color is right, but I hate saying the word African American because mm -hmm. I just don't think I I don't know of anybody who came from Africa that's you're an American, right? So why would I teach them to treat you any different than they treat anybody else? But they have no no you have no foundation. Okay, they have, hold they on, don't have hold no on, bear foundation. with me, man. Hold on, bear with me. Mm -hmm. I came from the sheriff's department. So did I. Okay, so let me ask you something. When I had my personal car assigned to me from the sheriff's department and I would drive down to Allen and Switzler to serve ex partes. Was my patrol car ever touched by anything? Was a deputy sheriff ever talked bad to take to when I well, never. The, the color, the, the, the neighborhoods of color did not do anything to a sheriff's department car. And they treated us with respect and we treated them with respect. So when I came here in 2000, it was a culture shock. Because I was wearing a blue uniform and not a brown uniform. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you what I, I will tell you what I told the people then. When I got put back then, it was called uh, uh, Beat 55. And I was put down in Allen, Switzer, and I went on foot patrol. I told people, whoa, do you know me? And I would tell them, hey, I came from the Sheriff's Department. I, I don't know what CPD has done in the past. I just know how I'm going to act as a police officer. And what I would expect an officer to do is not just not compare themselves to another law enforcement agency. Go, hold on. Good evening. My name is Officer Gordon with the Columbia Police Department. What has got you so worked up? Well, cops are X, Y, Z. Okay, I'm not going to disagree that some cops might be, but that's not how I am. And the reason I stopped you is because of me. And you explained them. Now, is there a reason you ran the stop sign there? I didn't run the stop sign. Okay, well, I look at it a little differently, and the cameras were recorded the intersection. So the law of violation report. Now we can't show people our cameras because that means you have to sit in the car. Mm -hmm. But people would say, I want to see the radar of the camera. I can't allow you to do that. There's, you cannot sit in our cars, just so everybody's aware. The car cost forty-two thousand dollars. The equipment ends thirty-eight. So we don't let people into our cars. They break an MCT. It's four grand. So, but what you do is you teach the officer to de-escalate that out. You have to de-escalate that out, and a lot of that comes with time and experience. And making a few mistakes and maybe taking some riders. Yeah, but you say a lot of your officers are young, two or three years. That's right, man. So how and can you fast track that for them? Well, can you ever can you ever fast track communication skills? Because I I will tell you, ma'am, it's hard to learn. When I was 21 years old, I made a lot of mistakes as a deputy. I just did. Now that wasn't rudeness complaints. I always wanted to do the right thing, but I made mistakes. Sure. Everybody does. But what we've got to do is minimize the mistakes and 
be fair. Go ahead, sir. Well, I think. Go ahead. Do y'all have a role to play? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, with, I'm, I'm just asking with a script. No. Can, can, script. Now, what we have started doing for a lot of our role playing exercises is, you know, one thing you find is that if you're using cops as role players, is their heart really in it? You know, sometimes you end up getting more goofing around than you do really, really training. So, what we've started doing is we've started hiring theater majors from Stevens and from MU, and when we want them to play a role, it's like, you know what, they're stepping into that role and they're playing. I mean, we've had kids that, that have have talked to us two or three times in the week before they're supposed to do this role play so they could get the role exactly how we wanted it. And so it's, it's those types of, so yes, most of our practical training has role playing with it. I think that, that part of it, when you talk about the young officer and how do you, how do you instill this sense of, yeah, you know? of not knowing, okay? Yeah. And, and I know that, that that part of what we do, so so we just got went through, um, there's, I don't get to teach a whole lot in the academy anymore, anymore but um, I, do, I do stress management and I do dealing with aggressive behavior. And so dealing with aggressive behavior is a four hour block. That's all that's required that's, that's named that. But... Dealing with aggressive behavior is, is trained throughout all of our role playing and through defensive tactics training and all of that. So, so there's a lot more de-escalation than just that four hours or, or any of that. And so one of the things that, that you really have to, you know, I, I do an exercise that, that okay, so, so describe me. What do you think about me? Okay. And so, and I, I actually, I've actually, I, I Look, I used to chew, I used to drive a Jeep. Um, you know, t tell me what kind of music I listen to. You know, and so, and, and then tell me, you know, t tell, me wh tell me who do you think I am, okay? And really what it is is it's, an, it's, it's a way to start having them identify preconceived nova bias, okay? Mm -hmm. Because most of the time, they want to be, you know, you probably wear a cowboy hat when you're off duty, and you've got several pairs of boots, and you listen to country music. I don't do any of it. Is that what you were thinking? Okay, but, 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 that's, but that's what I heard all the time. I'm a, I'm a metal person. I'm a hard rock guy. I've never owned a cowboy hat or a pair of boots. But, but it, was, it was that simple demonstration, and so then you go from there and you say, okay, look, you're 22 years old. You stop somebody on the street. You don't know them. You don't know. Did they come from from another another jurisdiction where cops beat people all the time, or were on the take, or any? You don't know their history. You don't know how they were treated by officers within your department the last time they were stopped. So how do you make it a positive contact? That's correct. And and that's. And, and so it, it does take time. It absolutely takes time. I think all of us in here would admit that, that when we were 21, we did things differently than we do now. But, you know, so, so that's the thing. We have, we have 16 weeks to take these kids that, you know, some of them maybe are a little more mature. I mean, I didn't start, I didn't start as an officer until I was 29 years old. Um, you know what? That helped me a whole bunch because I was a lot more mature and understood, and, and I had those personal experiences and professional experiences that I could draw from. And so what you have to do is, is in the academy and in in-field training or any other training that you can give them, you have to give them as much experience, even if it's, even if it's scripted, to give them as much experience as you possibly can. And that's why one of the things we, I mean, we, we have, we typically, we're required to have 600 hours. We typically have 660, 675 per academy. And those extra hours are mostly additional scenario-based training, role-playing exercises and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Because it's just not enough. You know, 600 hours is the minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I sit on the post commission, and actually I believe that that is actually going to go to 700 hours minimum. 
Um, so some of these scenarios and, and role play comes into play when you're training them to do traffic stop. Absolutely, yes, yes. The, yes, uh, there's there's some of that, but and, and that's the whole deal. I mean, you know, our first three weeks of the academy is pretty pretty much classroom oriented, but it's building that foundation. I mean, you know, last week they started their 40 hours of constitutional law. They're finishing it up this week. Um, you know, we, we have a we have a very good constitutional law instructor because he challenges them. I mean, the Constitution isn't black and white. It's it. It, it gives the officer discretion. A lot of the problems we have is because of that discretion. Let's face it, if, if the Constitution said you can do this and you can never do this, mm -hmm. it, it'd be pretty simple. We'd know exactly who is, who is racial profiling or, or who, is, who is causing the disparity issues within our department. Right. But because of the way the Constitution is written, there is that officer discretion that we have to train. You know, I think another part of the whole process is selection. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would love to say, you know, Columbia, what you need to do is you need to not hire anybody that's under 25 years of age and has less than two years experience. But where are you going to get those people? Unless you want to start paying sixty or $65,000 a year for a two-year officer. Then you can do that. But, you know, I, I mean, I don't want the additional taxes to, to see that happen either. But, but you know, so, so I think that I think selection has things to do with it. And, and like I said, you're not going to catch everybody. I mean, there are going to be some some that, that are going to slip through. It doesn't I mean, and Columbia does. I, I mean, the, the 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 inventories that they do. Or, uh, you know, they do the MMPI, which, which there are a lot of places out there that do. And I think, do you guys still do the IPI? Mm -hmm. So the IPI is police specific. And it can actually, from your answers, and then we have a, a psychologist <coughs> who reads those, and you have an interview with the psychologist. Yeah, I've been through the process. You know, but, 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 but think about the small departments that don't. Or, yeah. or the larger part, departments that don't either. And so... You know, I think some of those things help. Yeah. I, I think you also, the one factor that's not considered is, and, and, uh, and this is something realistic needs to understand, is, is the officer scared? Um, I'm sorry, I'm just the officer Is the officer scared? There, there's, an, there's, there's an intimidation. Yeah. Especially, especially if they're a newer officer and they're used to doing traffic stops. And the first sound of someone's mouth is hostility. Okay, well, that's a threat. Because mm -hmm. our uniform stands for the law. You know, it stands for, you know, as long as the stop is lawful and with our reasonable suspicion, or, well, I call it moral, ethical, and legal. The three steps to anything law enforcement has to be moral, ethical, and legal. As long as it's within those reasons, and we walk up to somebody, and the first thing out of their mouth is you're verbally attacked. It, it, even even if it's not using foul language, but you, but it's 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 not. I don't expect anybody to, to bow to the police because we are servants of the police department. But if someone you stop them, they go, what "Do you want?" Okay. okay. Well, okay. That rises the officer's level. Now we talk about the officer needs to de-escalate the situation, but the officer also has a right to go home. And let's face it. There's officers that are being attacked every day in the United States. And that's a scary time to be a police officer. Mm -hmm. So what I tell people is, and I've always said this, and one of the things we try to we try to preach, especially the kids, if you're scared of the police, do what they tell you, file the complaint afterwards, or ask for an instant review, because we've done many of those where kids were stopped. An instant review was done, and then the kids were explain why, what happened. Sometimes the sergeant around the scene say, like we did a felony car stop on a car one night that was a, a enterprise leasing vehicle that had failed to be returned, but actually had been returned and released, and the kids were driving it that night, but it was still listed as stolen because enterprise never called us. And we stopped and we did a felony car stop. We took some kids in custody for a stolen car that was not stolen anymore because it, all because enterprise didn't return the call or didn't tell us. We took all the kids and all the parents, and we explained exactly why we did. They got guns pointed at them. Quickly, within, I think, the first or second person, they realized, 
hold on here, something's not right. Now this was several years ago, so it wasn't something recent. But that's an example of when we call that instant debrief. It needs to be done with the people involved and the parents and said, hey, this is why we pointed guns at your, your kids, and this is what was happening. It was a stolen car for a little while, and a potential threat to officers. So you ask, how, how, do we, how do we train an officer? Well, also part of that is, how do we get the trust back so the, the, the kids or the adults don't act that way towards the police? So that, that's the fine balance we've got to find, but that comes with the trust that we have to... Because it ultimately, let's face it, it's up to the police department to, 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 well, it's up to the city of Columbia because it can't be done by the police itself. But you have to have the trust of the people in order to, to, to not, you're always going to have some fractions that are never going to trust the police. It's always going to be, uh, that's the criminal element, you know, and, and honestly, as I've said time and time again, the criminal element should fear the police. If, if you're here to do bad things to good people, you should fear us. Because that's our job to put you in jail. But if you're a good, honest person and maybe you made a mistake at that one moment and did a traffic violation, you should not fear our police. We should be able to walk up and be professional at all times. Approach. I hate the. Do you know why I stopped you? Because all that does is open up a smart ass comment coming at you, and then you you have it on, right? And yeah. I did that one night. Well, and that's that's the way we used to be taught. Yeah. Because it was well, an admission of guilt. It was an admission of guilt. If, if I walk, if I stop you, Jerome, and and you know why I stopped you, and you say, "Yeah, man, I rolled through that stop sign back there. Thank you very much. I'm writing that on the ticket." Right. Right. right? Well, I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Yeah. But but that's but that's exactly right. That's the way we used to be taught. You know. But... And and to your point earlier, I think that, you know, I I think it 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 takes time because while Columbia is a very young department. You know, there's there's behaviors that have been part of policing that need to be kind of filtered out, and yeah. that and that does take time. I mean, you know, you look at you look at okay, yes, we we've got 50% of our officers are are two or, or under three years, let's say, or 60%, whatever that number is. How many of those officers come from other departments? You know, and and so. Not just four or five from LATI. I can I can vouch for how they're trained, but those officers coming in from other departments. So that's that's part of my thought on the on the selection process, right? right? Because if you know if, if we could say okay, you you have to go to LATI to be hired by the city of Columbia or Columbia Police Department, then that's one thing. But obviously, you aren't going to get enough through. The application process, and 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 you know, I'm, I, we don't want to just hire anybody. So so that whole selection process, I think, plays a role as far as okay. So who do we have on our department? And if we have folks that have come from other departments, you know, keep in mind, yes, they have to go through the MMPI and the IPI, and they go through the psychologist interview. Um, you know, they're going to have an interview with the chief. They've got a board interview. They've got. I mean, Columbia does a very thorough job compared to a lot of other departments, but I'll tell you, there are still people that slip through the process. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, how far they get within their career can cause more or less problems, I guess. You know, obviously you want to get them out as quick as you can possibly can if they're going to cause problems, but... Uh, you know, let's face it, some people, they're, they're manip manipulative and they're secretive and they're swirly and, you know, they, they, they find a way to kind of kind of sneak around and stay around for a long time and now all of a sudden they're an FTO and they've trained three or four or five people. And now you've got this this problem and I think that, that, that uh, you know, I, I think that, that, you know, Columbia does a, does a good job of cutting the head off of that early. But I think that, that when you bring somebody in from another department, then you've got, you just don't know them as well. You know what? Because I will tell you, not every academy in the state does it the way we do it. I could also tell absolutely you that, do. I could also tell you the body cameras, in comparison to when I started in 1991, the body cameras do a great job. We, we have an excellent selection process. I, I wash out more people than we hire. I am very confident in the people that we're hiring now. Do they have the ability to do the job? That's what the academy and field training is for. 
And then usually within the first two years, we kind of know what kind of officer they're going to be. But also body cameras don't hide. Uh, our policy says that if you go on a call and you're in contact with the public in reference to a call, you shall have that body camera activated. Now, there's also times where, you know, somebody's at a quick trip and say, hey, can you tell me how to get to I-70? Well, they don't activate their camera for that. But if they're on a call for service, just like I worked the road today, I went to an, an, an accident, my body camera, I was wearing one, the camera was turned on, the complete time I was involved in the public, and I turned it off when I was done. These body cameras have exposed your trouble officers. If you have a trouble officer, suddenly they have two or three failure body camera activations. Well, what do you mean your camera didn't turn off? That's a red flag. Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, ma'am. Big time red flag because they are getting burned into their head because these cameras will save their careers 99% of the time because the complaint, our cameras show what good cops we have. Now, it also shows some mistakes that most of the time are training issues. But, but, but if they turn off their camera or their camera is not activated, there's a problem. They better have a real good excuse. Um, they can't corrupt the files. They have no way to download the camera. It has to go into a dock, or it has to be downloaded using the software with a, with a you know, and, and they can't like, go home and erase the camera. It doesn't work. They can't run over a camera, because we had one run over during a fight downtown. <laughs> well, we sent the camera off to Axon, and they were able to download the videos off of it for us. We've had cameras stolen during fights, because, it's, well, because they fall off the uniform. Because they're, they're all over. So they fall down, and somebody picks it up. But they can't do anything with it because they can't watch the video because it's all proprietary. But the point I'm trying to make is, man, you start to see red flags when you start to see complaints mm -hmm. against an officer, and then you can start looking for a video in the video in a day. Hold on, why wasn't your camera activated? So we are probably the most closely watched professional, um, not job, but uh, career out there and body cameras should help us create trust within the community. Because there is no doubt that if, you're, if your son is stopped by the police, you should be able to watch the video and see how that interaction went. Now, I will say this. The struggle has always been the law is colorblind. The law is colorblind. The way that you enforce the law with people of color is the same way you would enforce the laws over here, over here, and over here. Whether they're an attorney that makes a million dollars a year, or they live in government housing, or they live in on a farm, it does not matter. The law should be for equally and without prejudice. Now we all have our biases, but I always struggle to sit there and say the pigment of someone's skin does not make them who they are. It's the character. If I was to cut his hand right now, it, he would bleed red. Just like if I cut my hand, I would bleed red. That's what we try to eliminate. The fact that you drive a car that may be 20 years old and is a, a beater or a brand new BMW should be completely irrelevant. It should be. It should be. As long as it, just like I had, just like we talked about an officer's car one time because he has a, a, a beater car and he said, well, that's just the car. I, I don't care as long as it's legal. But it's Lincoln Oil, so you just know that. You know, it should not matter. And that's how we would expect our officers to enforce the law. Just like we start talking about traffic stop data, as you drive home tonight, look at the car in front of you and tell me what's the color of the skin of the driver of the car in front of you. I traffic stopped a car a few weeks ago that was three blocks down when I saw the violation. There's no way of knowing who was in that car. But I stopped the car anyway because they cut somebody off almost caused an accident. So, anyway. But your data says that uh, if my husband, who is in his 50s, um, is in, in beat, uh, what was that, 20? 20. 20. Or in beat 70, 70, 70 he is 70. seven times more likely to get stopped. I would sit there and say that what needs to be assessed about 70D, which is downtown, is We've had some after-hour clubs that have had some shootings out. Yes. So uh, I also ask that the groups, and I know Mr. Love's look at this, it's not the number of stops. That, you can't just look at the disparity index if the number of traffic stops is only 50. Like, if I go stop two cars, I'll give you an example. Last year, 
in one month, I stopped two cars, uh, both, one was on the interstate and one was on getting off of I-70, you know, St. Charles Road. One, I was getting on the interstate, this car just went, I mean, it was flying down the interstate, got on the problem, stopped it. Driver happened to be um, a person of color. Gave him a warning, told him to go on his way. Get back on the interstate because I was going to a specific place. Get back on there, another car in front of me had tinted taillight covers and it was uh, tinted, yeah, taillight covers and it was nighttime. I, why anybody puts tinted taillight covers on your brake lights? I have no idea. Because hmm. I couldn't see that he was braking. So I stopped. It's another person of color. So what's my, two stops, what's my racial disparity index? Yeah, it was very high. So, so when you start looking, and I'm, I know Mr. Love's taking this consideration. If you look overall, our number of traffic stops, though, has gone tanking down. Because we're just not stopping, because a lot of it's just, you know, um, we're not stopping a lot of cars to begin with. Our officers are entirely too busy. So take those things into consideration. The number may be going up, but as the traffic stops going down. And then we have to ask that. I'm also interested to see now that we've got this north building open up, and downtown is not the only headquarters. Because if you look at all of our traffic stop data, now I've seen the maps recently, a lot of our traffic stop data was on those main roads going, always going back to CPD. So at any time of the day, you would have 60 officers multiple times driving back to downtown Columbia. And what surrounds downtown Columbia? So now that we have a north precinct, it'll be interesting to see how that data changes a little bit. I'm hoping it changes a little bit. So it should be interesting. Yeah. Yes. Boy, I don't share. He wants to go. I make a motion. That we table the conversations till next time and call it the day. Can I second? I'll second. Okay, we move and second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Opposed. I have one more issue I would like to bring up. Uh, that would be on the uh, dashboard. We requested to see like what the Columbia Police Department is using. Yes, and I, I'm happy to address that and other questions that you had from last month briefly in the staff report. But I did ask about what we could see in those dashboards. And what I was told was that with the new state legislation that Assistant Chief Gordon talked about a little bit earlier, there may be some concerns about what we can see relating to individuals. We might, however, be able to come in and demonstrate what those dashboards look like. That would be fine. Sample data. Yeah, the, the law changed and made personnel files close records. And that, so that's fine. I think we're looking for capabilities. So just even having like a list of the tables, the fields, what you're looking at, how it's displayed, I think that's still very germane to what we're trying to accomplish. I also think we've got a little hiccup going because they are, we are doing a background on a crime analysis person now. They did interviews last week. And we need that person to help us put the numbers together. So, with the loss of Jerry, that really handicapped situation as a whole. So, he the main person to do that stuff. I, I don't like giving excuses. I'm just telling you that, that they, this law really kind of impacted us. We weren't quite ready for that. So. But, yeah, otherwise, that was my only sole concern was that. Honestly. Okay, this meeting is adjourned. Our next meeting is going to be October 12th, 5 